Good morning. My name is Ariel Tonkin, and I am here to introduce the next session. Welcome, everyone. We are a group of Sephardi, Arab Jewish, and J. Swana Jewish artists, actors, theater makers, devisers, directors coming in from around Turtle Island. And we are here to offer a little bit of a testimony and a little bit of an, a glimpse at our work and our lifelong commitment to Palestinian liberation and solidarity. I'll start with a short poem from Mazal Masoud Ateji, who is an herbalist and a healer. Um, as an opening convocation and prayer. Then we'll move into some introductions of our group here today. And then we'll offer a collective Jewish Arab Swana Sephardi ritual um, as a lifelong commitment for Palestinian liberation. Maghreb, here now. Arab futures, here now. Rue is sprouting through the floorboards, disrupting my numb, my grief, breaking the walls of the matrix, crumbling, stumbling, dying worlds. Grandmother, great, 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 grandmother, great, great, great. Sand tornadoes in the palms of my hands. I see the map of us, all of us. Free. So again, hi everyone. My name is Ariel Tonkin, zooming in on Turtle Island from Ohlone land, so-called Berkeley, California. I'm an interdisciplinary artist and a member, a community member of the Council for the Season for Palestine with Golden Thread Productions. And next I'll briefly introduce uh, Lena Sibony. Would you like to say who you are? Um, I'm a performance artist, uh, tra traditionally based in Berkeley, California, Lonely Land as well, um, and super honored to be a part of this beautiful offering um, and recent performer with Golden Thread for their season for Palestine. Feel free to pass to the next one of our number. We'll just briefly introduce. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sivan, do you want to go? Sure. Hi, my name is Sivan Batat. I use she and they pronouns. I am a director uh, and cultural worker. I live in uh, Brooklyn, which is the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape people. And I am also the director of new work development at Noor Theater, which is a New York based theater company dedicated to uplifting and supporting and celebrating the work of theater artists of Middle Eastern and North African descent. Um, and I'm honored to be a part of this conversation too. I'll pass it to Coral. Hi, uh, my name is Coral Cohen. I am based um, in Lenape land as well, Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a director, divisor, writer, producer sometimes um, of theater and performance. And I'm really honored to be here as well. Um, I'll pass it to Danny. Hi, I'm Danny Brick. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, also um, joining today from uh, Muncie Lenape Land, aka Brooklyn. Um, and uh, I'm a playwright and actor. Um, and also a dialect coach and uh, organizer activist. Um, and uh, very, very grateful to be sharing this virtual space with such um, illustrious and, and heroic folks. I've been, you know, getting to catch some of the sessions so far, um, and it's a real honor. And, um, and yeah, glad to be here to have a, a, a little bit of the conversation that we have in our um, communities about uh, sort of who we are and where we're coming from and how we come to to this work of working towards Palestinian liberation and um, and and why that 
and how that connection is important. Mm -hmm. And I'll pass to um, is there who else is there to pass to? I'm not sure if I'm seeing everyone. Ariel, help me. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got. I think we're all we're okay, all great. In. Beautiful. So for folks joining us now and for folks watching this later, this is session number 19. And it's um, just about 6.30 p.m. in the PST zone, where I'm zooming in from, 9.30 a.m. in the Eastern zone, where I think the rest of our crew is coming in from, the Eastern time zone in Turtle Island. And it's 4.30 p.m. in Palestine. And the official title of our, of our session is Arab, Jewish, and Sephardi Artists for a Free Palestine. So... Um, I wish we could have an interactive Q&A with all of us watching because the, the semantics of these words, all of us inhabit these words differently. But I'll just start with the phrase Arab Jewish, which not no assumption that everyone, even of the five of us, lives inside of that um, descriptor. But um, there's a resource that I wanted to share off the top for folks at home. Um, Masoud Hayoun wrote this book, When We Were Arabs. It might be mirrored in my screen. Um, a Jewish Family's Forgotten History. And um, for folks like me, my siblings growing up in Turtle Island on, on the East Coast of the United States, the and each of us inhabit this differently in our different places in the Jewish diaspora, just to be the existence of Arab and Jewish in one body um, inside of the macro story of Zionism was basically categorically impossible. And a lot of us live inside of that sort of wrenching and vicissitude, but behold, we are here, we are alive, we are not a memory. Um, and because of the complexities of Zionist education and how we were taught that these things can't coexist, many of us who in born in the States, which I think this whole group is um, a US born group, but we'll tell you more about our stories and where we come from. A lot of the work that we've been doing in our individual art practices, in our collective as we've been finding each other through organizing, political arts and culture organizing, is to really heal those vicissitudes. And um, huge, huge homage, love, appreciation, and gratitude to the Movement for Black Lives for really galvanizing in our generation um, a nationwide and worldwide consciousness around racial justice and and healing for all bodies, including like mixed mixed bodies, pe people of color and people of culture, and um, and all of this is um, inalienable from and inextricably bound up in Palestinian liberation. And each of us will just tell you from our hearts and from our families and from our creative practices why we know that to be so and how we know that to be so. So I'll just read a little bit of a background of where we're, where we're coming from and where we're going. So again, as I described at the top, we're a mixed group. We come from different ethnic backgrounds within this category of Sephardi Jewish or Arab Jewish or Jaiswana, Jews from Southwest Asian and North African descent. We are all of us arts and culture workers, as you heard, for a free Palestine. Some of us are organizing with Jewish Voices for Peace. And if you haven't heard of that group yet, it's a U.S.-based group doing advocacy for Palestinian liberation, as well as cultural organizing. Um, and we're organizing in our local communities. Some of us teach in schools. Other of us, others of us are interfaith chaplains. Some of us are working with youth. Some of us are directing theater companies, um, both in, in um, Swana specific, specifically focused on these parts of our stories. Others of us are doing that um, in the broader arts community. And um it's the this phrase of just how you do anything is how you do everything and how we can bring liberatory praxis and a commitment, especially at this time. We're we're broadcasting live in the middle of a genocide, how all of our actions and words can be situated for towards a call. And as artists using our voices to insist on ongoing attention um, and heartfelt, focused. Um, clear-eyed call for Palestinian liberation as Jewish people. So um, we, in this next few minutes, we'll just tell you each a little bit of our stories, a little bit of how we're doing this work in our corners of the world. 
And then we want to create an immersive ritual with you all at home, whether you're watching this now synchronously or you'll be watching this later. So each of us have brought um, an object, um, a holy object, a treasured object. For some of us, it might be a childhood object. Others of us, it's something that we're living with and using with now. And if you're watching along and feel game for this, feel free to take a second to step away from your screen and see if there's an object in your place, in your space with you right now, a garment, an object on your body, a spice in your cabinet, a plant outside that anchors you to um, that like sort of a plumb line to the center of the earth to where you come from. It can be lived biological lineage, it can be chosen lineage, but for all of us diasporic bodies, um, we're interested as a group of artists in creating a prayer through all of us committing as, for many of us, settlers on the lands we live on now, um, to tethering back to the root lineages that we come from so we can move from a place of integrity, wholeness, richness, connectedness, um, to really practicing from right now this world that we're imagining living into when we win, when Palestine is free. And as the lands that we settle, we're working on decolonial projects. What is the live, vibrant future in which all of us, all human beings, all of life are living a liberated, um, emancipated lives where we are? And we'll do that. Part of how we'll do that is beginning to tether even more deeply to where we come from so we can anchor our bodies, press up from the earth, honor the land, heal the land, and um, build beauty and connectivity forward. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Lena and feel free to share a little bit any way you want to, to open the floor from there. Okay, such a um such a big big shoes to fill. Um my name is Lena Sibony. Uh I am originally from Berkeley, California. My family uh originates from Morocco. Uh and that has been a huge part of my identity growing up, but something that as I have shared in a few spaces more recently, something that was really kept in our home life. Uh something that I kind of talked about vaguely uh to friends, but was kept quiet for much of my life and a big part of coming into this new kind of beautiful anti-zionist world uh was reckoning with that quietness and making it a hell of a lot louder um and, and through specifically um solidarity spaces and meeting other incredible role models like Ariel um and performing art spaces where that part of me was not only welcome, but kind of nourished and cared for has been such a big part of me growing as a performance artist. Uh, for so long, I could only be Jewish in theater spaces. That was the only identity marker aside from being, you know, vaguely white identifying. Uh, I was only really alone allowed to ever be Jewish. And that's a huge part of who I am. It's a big part of my Moroccan identity as well. But um, it wasn't just the only part. Um, and kind of getting involved with Golden Thread um, and doing things that were very explicitly intertwining the two and really embracing this North African Arab identity has been such a blessing. Um, and really opened my eyes to the ways in which my identity doesn't have to be one thing that can be like all of the many things uh and really inspired me to create more of my own work um and think critically and write and feel like this is a whole new side that i get to explore and want to find other people which this call is amazing group of people that are doing this work all around the country around the world um really embracing these cross identi identities um and i think as performing artists it is often our duty to tell the truth um and the truth of 
the complexity that it is to hold being Jewish and being Arab and identifying with this part of my body and my soul that a lot of people who I love that are my family members do not want to identify with and would rather section off into almost an internalized fetishization of their um, selves has been so hard and and fascinating in other ways, but really challenging to want this to be a truthful thing, a truthful thing that is a part of our history. Um, and yet, in the context of having family that lives in the occupied territories and that really wants to keep Morocco and the Arab world as a part of their history and as a part of a culture that they can bring out when it is beneficial to them and not something that like they carry with them every day as I feel like my body and the way that I look and what who I am is not something that I can put aside um, has been a huge part of the reckoning of wanting and hoping for a free Palestine where we can understand that the places where we are both in America in the occupied territories and all over are filled with these contradictions and that is a powerful beautiful thing as opposed to something that is should be silenced um so that's kind of how i've come into this work and come into this like hoping and praying and needing liberation uh, for myself for my family for everyone in Palestine, including the people that are locked up in the chains of supremacy and colonialism, uh, which is a very powerful tool and something that I hope and pray in me taking one step forward in the space of activism moves us just a little bit further. I'll wrap there, um, but I'm so grateful that people are doing this work and that you know, despite the challenges, we're still coming together and moving forward as artists and creating spaces for people to see what can be, especially Arab Jews. Thank you. And I will pass it along. Thank you so much. Uh, Danny, feel free. Hi, is, is my sound still okay? hear me uh i'm danny brick um so um just very grateful again to 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 be here in the space with you all my um so my background my my family background is uh turkish sephardic and ashkenazi and cuban and um so I, it's, you know, it's been a long journey for me to sort of hold all of that. It's a complicated and, uh, I'm joining from New York with where I live and which I often say, uh, is, it feels like my homeland because all, all the different parts of my family, when they came to the U S they came here and I was born here. And yet I'm also a settler here. And so, um, holding and unpacking that complexity has been a big part of my work all sides of my family have a very complicated uh relationship to our own histories of oppression which has then led our communities in general to sort of a very reactionary um position uh and um uh who who was it yesterday um Nancy, I think Nancy Agabian, I hope I'm getting her name right in, in the Armenian Palestinian solidarity session is talking about the importance of, of rather than reaching up to our historical oppressors for help to reach across to, to communities with, um, with similar experiences and to highlight that. And, um, and so I've been really grateful to, um, uh, as an artist and as an activist, and it was very much the one that led me to the other, um, to find myself in, in spaces, um, in community with, with folks here and, and, and others who aren't, 
uh, here with organizations like JVP and uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and JFridge, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, um, and being a part of uh, founding and developing and um, benefiting in a really deep way from these caucus uh, spaces where we've been grappling with, like, who are we and where are we coming from? And um, what is our uh, unique contribution to a discourse that is so um, obscured with disinformation um, and with, uh, with historical revisionism that disconnects us? Um, and uh, one of the things that's been really beautiful for me in, in that work has been learning the, the music of our, our different traditions. Um, and one song that, uh, that we've learned, um, and I'll credit, uh, Laura Al-Kaslasi, who's, who's not here as a teacher of this song, um, it's called Rimun Ramatni, and, uh, Sivan's smiling, we've sang this together. Um, and there, it, it's an old, you know, Andalusian, North African song from, from the Middle Ages, uh, popularized by Salim Halali. Am I getting that right, Sivan? Um, and there's a line in there that that says, and excuse me, I'm not a native speaker of Arabic, but um, the Andalusian people understand poetry. And I, what that means to me is it's like, we we get it. We, we, we can read between the lines. We know our history. We, we, um, we have a perspective. Um, we we can see what's going on because we, you know, we, we've seen it before. And, and, uh, and because the, um, the narrative that there's this dualism of Jew and Arab or, you know, Europe and the rest of the world or, you know, whatever it is, um, that we know from, from our history and our identity that it's, that it's more complicated than that that it's more beautiful than that um and that that uh that shared history if we shed light on it can can maybe um inshallah lead us to uh a, a different future that that um that can feel hard to imagine sometimes um and uh um genocide requires disconnection um and some folks were talking about that in, in previous sessions as well that um uh it it wants us to to turn off and to ignore and to and to forget um and by asserting our 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 shared histories and telling our stories and and learning our stories from each other um hopefully we can uh counter that and, and uncover what should be obvious which is that um genocide is always a crime against all, all humanity uh I'll, I'll 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 pause there and um, i'm forgetting who we said would would go next thank you so much danny coral would you like to share a little bit uh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I really uh, resonate with both what Lena and Danny has spoken about so far, as well as Ariel really um, beautifully put around um, how all of our identities are, uh, have been split open in some ways historically, and now um, bringing them together has become sort of uh, a beautiful and, uh, but sometimes difficult work. Um, so the way that I came to know my, uh, Arab Jewish identity is through, um, my work as an artist and through the community I found through my work as an artist. Um, specifically I'll, I'll name two members of our community who aren't with us, uh, Laura Alcaslasi, who's already named today, and um, Hannah Eliza Goldman, who I worked with on a project back in 2018. And they 
very lovingly helped me understand who I was as an Arab Jew and um, introduced me to texts and writers and ideas um, and other community members here in um, the city, as well as uh, all over the country, who helped me understand my place in um, this whole uh, crazy <laughs> world. Um, so I will say that for, as, as Lena, I think said, and also Ariel, um, I grew up very steeped in Zionism from both sides of my mixed family. Um, and it was very difficult for me without, while knowing how, what, while knowing that there was, um, how do I put it? Like there was darkness in our history. I, for a really long time, I tried to push it away because I couldn't, um, I couldn't understand myself in, in that, um, history. And it's through actually learning about, uh, the history of Arab Jews in, um, the occupied land, um, and how, our history is uh, intertwined with uh, Palestinian history in uh, that land. And uh, for those of you who don't know, many, many uh, Middle Eastern Jews were uh, brought in by the Zionist state uh, to uh, displace uh, Palestinians in um, the state. And so many of our families were, were used um, sometimes through uh, not so honest practices of bringing them to the state to, um, and, and, and promises were made that were not fulfilled, um, to displace, uh, Palestinians and, uh, to create a demographic majority in the, in, in the state. So, um, learning that history was really important for me to honestly deprogram my, uh, Zionist upbringing and ideas and understand how um, our struggles are linked and how much we have so much more in common in some ways with uh, Palestinians and other Arabs in the land um, than some of the leaders of the Zionist state and the people who created the Zionist state. So I really credit uh, both the people in my community, uh, and the work that I was able to make with them and also the understanding of our history to, um, bringing me to this place and to this very, very important, uh, stance and activism towards a free Palestine. Um, and I do feel that through our identification in our bodies and our understandings of who we are and how we have so much more in common than we have apart, we are able to build one day and hopefully we'll be able to build one day. Um, and the solidarity is really important to me and um, I feel it in, in my body. And I think Lena also mentioned this. I think it's, when it comes from within, when it comes from um, our lineage, when it comes from that understanding of how these uh, connections and identities and culture have been necessarily taken away from us um, for political reasons, um, and how radical it is to reclaim those and reclaim our uh our arab identity and uh say say it loudly and proudly about how we do exist like ariel said like and our 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 bodies are manifestations of how um we are real and our solidarity is uh is is in our is in our blood i guess so i um I'm really honored to be here and in the space. And um, I really thank all 
of the people in my community and um, the ancestors who have done the work of bringing us to this place. So thank you. Thank you so much. Sivan, would you like to tell a little bit about who you are, what you're up to? Hi, I'm Sivan. Um, I use she and they pronouns. Uh, I am also joining us from Lenape Lands in Brooklyn. Um, I'm feeling so full and moved by um, what all of you have shared on this call and to be in community with all of you. Uh, just to give a, a little overview of how I come to this conversation and, and to this work, um, my uh, father's people are from Baghdad, from Iraq. Uh, we can trace that lineage back to the 1490s there. There was some movement from Basra to Baghdad over the years, um, but there was a very, very rich and robust Jewish community in Iraq um, up until the 1940s, 1950s, when um, many of that, many folks in that community, if not almost all, um, left. Uh, and my mother's people are white Ashkenazi Jews uh, from Poland and Russia via via Brooklyn, um, came to the United States, Turtle Island in the late 1880s um, with a huge wave of um, migration to the U.S. Um, and I often say that Brooklyn and Baghdad are the are the homelands. Um, and I'm honored I get to live in and at least have a relationship with one of those places right now, though I do dream that maybe someday I can have a relationship through visitation with Baghdad, though that has not been part of my my truth yet. Um, I'm thinking so much about uh, this line from Mazaz, from Maz's poem that you shared with us, Ariel, at the beginning, that uh, I see the map of all of us free. Um, and that really hit me this morning um, because it captures, as Mazal is so often able to do, it captures so potently why we do this work and why I'm here doing this work, because uh, the map that I see um, for Palestinian liberation and for uh, all of us to be free includes the Jewish people and includes the Palestinian people. And the only way to that freedom is for all of us to be free together. And so I'm here um, speaking from that place. Uh, I I um, also really resonate with Coral um, that the way I came to an understanding of my own Arab Jewish identity was through the theater, uh, through theater artists who um, helped me deal with my own internalized anti-Arab-ness uh, that I had learned in a very sort of Zionist upbringing and in Jewish day schools in the United States, um, where sort of the two histories I was taught of the Jewish people are the, is the history of um, Eastern European Jewry um, and the history of Zionism. Those were the two, the two histories that I was taught. And I kind of wondered, where does my grandfather from Baghdad, who picks me up from school, speaking in Arabic to me, where do, where do we fit into that? And I, for a long time, I just thought something had gone wrong that we had become Jewish somehow along the way um, until I started meeting other um, other Arab uh, Jews who share that identity and 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 also other um, Middle Eastern artists who helped me open my eyes to that specifically Leila Buck um, who's an extraordinary uh, Lebanese theater artist who really helped me open myself when I was uh, still in my schooling process to the idea that I might be Arab because that wasn't even language that um, I was uh, open to at a certain point in my life because of how potently Zionism has tried to uh, um, wrench those two sets of selves to tell us that we can be Jewish or we can be Arab. Um, but for many of us, our people's native languages is Arabic and our our communities come from places that were Arabic speaking um, for a very, very long time. Um, and so understanding how those, those two identities have been structurally separated from each other um, systemically by a system of colonialism and Zionism um, to cause us to have more fragmentation. And that that fragmentation is actually a part of the story, um, is actually the success of it. The idea that I might not have access to all of those truths and, and being an artist has allowed me to um, lean into the places I don't know, lean into the sets of fragments, lean into the stories that I don't know, um, to imagine into those. Uh, you know, I, I often think that organizing is very similar to the work of directing. I say this sometimes as an organizer and a director. Um, you know, we imagine something that is not yet there. And then we work together to create the thing that is not yet there. So when I begin to direct a play, I'm imagining an entire world, an entire future um, on a stage. And then I'm working with a whole group of people to take that vision and to chase after it with everything we have. And that's what organizing is. We're imagining a future. We're imagining a world that is not yet there. And we're and we're assembling together to chase after that vision. Um, and we are uh, 
we are allowing ourselves to dream into something um, new and to dream into something that does not yet exist. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the work that I've been honored to get to do over the last year in particular, but over many years, you know, in in partnership with, as a, as a director and as a lead artist on a project, in partnership with artists who are doing work that, um, you know, resists uh, the history of Jews and Arabs being enemies, resists the narrative that we might be enemies, resists this, um, fights for the liberation of Palestine, fights for the liberation of the Palestinian people. Um, I've been able to do that as a as a director and amplify those projects. And I've also been able to do that um, as an artistic leader at Newer Theater, where we really prioritize our community's voices and we prioritize the stories that most need to be heard right now. Um, and it's been uh, a constant and ongoing learning process as I continue to meet the edges of my own journey, meet the edges of my own knowledge, learn more, unlearn more. Um, uh, even my relationship to the Arabic language is, is deep in that way. I often joke that I spend more time writing poetry about how it feels to learn Arabic than actually doing my Arabic homework. So I, you know, I need to dig a little bit deeper into that process. Um, but, uh, you know, as we, um, as we fight to keep our Arab Jewish identities not a memory, um, there is personal stake in that um, because we see the map of all of us free um, together, as Mazar said. So I want to just bring in one quote from an Iraqi Jewish poet named Samir Nakash. And, and I kind of love this story because I think it exemplifies um, what it is to try to chase after these identities and our artistic work and to use it um, to, to fight for for liberation for all of us. Um, my brother is a musician. He released an album recently, and we had found a quote in translation in some scholarly in a scholarly article by Lita Levy, and we were trying to find the quote in the original Arabic. And I'm sifting through books of Arabic poetry that I'm trying to find this kind of uh, needle in a haystack one line to find it in the original Arabic, so my brother and I can, you know, put it in his music. And um, we found it after after searching through many many pages and 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 sifting through many many books and wondering if we were even on the right page of the this and and you know my um ability to read arabic is limited and so i'm i'm, I'm spelling out each word and each letter so carefully to try to find in an entire book one passage which is what it feels like sometimes um and we found it and uh forgive my my arabic is not native so i will offer uh simran akash's poetry here but um perhaps not with perhaps not perfectly and we lean into that all the time um wa nahnu shatatun yatajadibu tarafa al fisam intima wa la intima which means and we are fragments being pulled by the two sides of the split belonging and unbelonging and he wrote this about being a jew in 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 baghdad in the probably 1930s um and so i often think about the idea of being fragments on two sides of a split belonging and unbelonging um and where we where we find that belonging and unbelonging um and for me i have found it in the streets this year in many ways i have found it in my relentless jewish community who has turned to the streets day in and day out to fight for a ceasefire, to fight for a free Palestine, to say, do not use our names for this violence. Do not claim that this is our safety and security because a world in which we are only free as Jews, if someone else is not free, is not a world in which we are free as Jews and is not a world that our Jewish identity teaches us, um, is, is the moral map of our justice. And so um, where I have been able to find that belonging and that sometimes unbelonging, but mostly belonging has been in the streets this year, um, in the fight and in the struggle and and in the creative spaces where we have been able to sort of bridge our our work um so i'll i'll offer that some nakash poetry and and close there turn it back to you ariel beautiful thank you sivan i mean i mean ashe all of it um wow so in the spirit of the aggregate of all of our fragments is greater than the sum of each of the parts, like when we when we pull it together, each individual part, and each of us, we may or may not have access to a, a felt, embodied, sensed lineage from the countries that our parents, grandparents come from. But the the tastes that we're able to reach back to when we aggregate them together, we're making a, a new diasporic hybrid culture, and we're also listening and learning and committed to the vitalization and ongoing thriving of Palestinian culture as part of, of ours. So I'll invite us each to grab an object. And yeah, folks at home, please, please join us in this practice. We are going to pray with um, 
a haptic practice, uh, touching the past, touching the present towards actively practicing it, um, imagining the future, this liberatory future that we're talking about. So as theater makers, as performers, we use props. And as people of culture, we use artifacts, we use ritual objects to, I guess, like reinflate uh, the sponge, so to speak. It's a way, it's portable architecture. It's a way of, um, through all of the exile, uh, forced displacement, um, which we know from our histories and we're watching enacted in our name now in Palestine, um, when we can't touch the original land, we can touch an embodied memory. And when we don't, when we have not inherited a physical object, we as artists can conjure that object and create it. And then, as I described, sort of reinflate it in time and space through touch, through smell, through sound, through our voices. So that's the invitation that I'll propose now. And we five will, will perform that for you. But I really invite you, if you don't, if you're just watching us, to even just take a sec, and we can do this all five of us together now, um, to breathe into a dedication to whom or to what are you dedicating this practice? Very, very specifically, when you feel into a free Palestine and a freedom for all of us on that land and in this land, who do you see? And we'll take, let's just take five deep breaths, each of us in our own place to tether. I will begin, and I want to dedicate this short practice to Muhammad Arantisi and family, um, spouse and two kids who are in Gaza right now, and to whom my community here in the SF Bay Area has a strong felt connection as they're working to rebuild their home. So Muhammad, this practice is for you. I will share two ritual objects and maybe I'll share two short practices with them. So I've got here, um, what I've learned is a old Sephardi ritual object. It's called the Bolsiga. It's an amulet. This one was created by my friend Daf and David Yosef. And it's got pulverized um, orange rind or orange peel. And I wish you could smell it, but I'll describe it through the screen. It's got like a a deep, musky, citrusy, like velvety, um, really evocative scent. And my buddy embroidered um, protection against the evil eye on it. And it stays with me in my pocket. And these, these traditions were said to have herbal properties. So like actual medicinal olfactory properties for the wearer or the character, the carrier. And they've also had prayers sewn into them and were sent to a person on their journey, kept in a pocket for healing, kept under the pillow for a prayer for fertility or for love. And Bolsika is one small way, like through the palm of a hand, that um, this Sephardi diasporic body can tether to that part of my lineage and my practice. And yeah, just big love to all of the the queers, the femmes, like all of the folks who have kept the herbal medicine lineages alive. And um, yes, I'll leave this one at that. I also wanted to share this. This is um, tefillin or phylacteries, leather phylacteries. And I had a chance to bring this out this week with Andrea Asaf. Um, through, we're working on devising the SF version of 11 Reflections on the Nation. But this is um, a silk uh, tefillin bag that was embroidered in Morocco in Casablanca and by aunties of my father. Uh, for his bar mitzvah. Um, and phylacteries are uh, straps that are typically worn by um, Jewish male-bodied folks in prayer. And 
it's uh i'm holding a, a black leather strap it's got a smooth surface um it's dyed black on the top and you can see the brown of the skin on the underside and it's got two parts to it there are two boxes and inside the box is the shema prayer and which is a hear listen prayer similar to the prayer that we have in in arabic in the muslim tradition that god is one and um this object is bound on the forehead on the arm wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and um when i enact this object there's like a winding unwinding rewinding process that i get to physicalize on my arm on my body and it's um i guess a yoke or a tether or a tie that physically reminds me that i'm bound to my lineage that i'm obligated to speak up for justice and for liberation for myself my family for all beings for um yeah and i'll leave it at that it's i'll leave it with a prayer and a question for all of us of like how do i ariel how do you wherever you are at home stay physically connected in an embodied and felt way that you remember that your vitality my vitality my aliveness is inextricably bound in the full freedom of all living beings on this planet and how can my speech how can my actions my resources my time my attention um stay laser beam focused on that truth so i pray that i remember that every day when i enact this jewish ritual and wrap my tefillin and i stay connected to morocco through this embroidery um all right i'll pass to maybe we'll popcorn it we'll go in a different order and we'll just be with you viewers at home for about 15 more minutes. So really do settle into where you are and an invitation, viewers at home, to come back to your senses. What do you smell around you? What do you see around you? What's the temperature on your skin as you're listening to us touch our objects and feel our objects? Perhaps, Coral, do you feel like you would be down to jump in next? No worries. We can pass. I see your expression. Um, Lena? Um, sure. Oh, you yeah, want to go? Coral, you're ready. Let's sure, Yeah. Um, so I, I don't have a physical object, but I'm going to share a memory. Um, and I, I dedicated this to my grandma, my Safta Miliam, who, uh, passed away basically right as I was starting to understand this history. Um, I really wanted to interview her and talk to her about it. Um, but she actually just passed away right in in those moments um and she spoke uh arabic as her native language she um was born in what was still palestine um pre-independence and uh she uh actually sustained an injury at five years old from from the war of independence uh so she is my kind of greatest tie to the land as well as um, to that part of my identity. And she was really a famous chef. Uh, she made really, really great food. And one of my biggest ways that I've been able to reconnect with um, that side of my culture is through food. However, um, she did not pass those recipes down to my mother or anybody that I am in contact with. So um, I'm sharing a memory of in, uh, I think it was 2020 or 2021, where um, I uh, learned from another community member, Annabelle Rabia, who many of us know, um, how to uh, cook kuba bamiya, which is something that my uh, sefta did cook when I was younger. And uh, being able to make the food that she made even if it was imperfect and it didn't exactly taste like how she made it because she was amaz an amazing cook and I am a barely uh, can cook at all. Um, it was really, it, it physically made me remember who I was and how, um, how I was connected to her and to that lineage and that it is mine to hold as well. Um, despite the fact that so many in my family and in the world tried to uh, disconnect me from that and from her and from her language and culture. So 
um, I'm putting forth that memory of reconnection, of uh, performing the actions of the ancestors in some way um, to reconnect and to taste and feel and smell those things that, um, and through community, through through our 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 community here, um, showing us and sharing, uh, so that I was able to reconnect to my own family. So that's my offering. Thank you, Coral. And may your grandmother's, may your Siti Safta's memory be a blessing always. And would you like to speak her name into the space so we can bring in that ancestor? Um, Miriam Hazan Kanani. May your memory bless you always. And I'm so glad that Coral named Annabelle Rabia. Annabelle is someone, so for folks watching at home, is an Arab Jewish person, also of Iraqi descent, like you, Sivan. Um, who has had the opportunity with an, with an auntie, a living auntie to return to the Bosphorus, like return to that land, and who for many years has been cultivating through that, I believe it's called like the um, the Arab Jewish Seed Saving Collective, Iraqi Seed Saving Collective, um, is physically connected to folks from the Levant, working to save seeds from the middle of war zones, um, so that phys- in a physical way, we can still grow um, the the seeds of of the land that we all come from in 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 the face of the war machines that are seeking to eradicate all of us and um, all of the life from that land. So big love to Annabelle. And part of that work, and you're seeing that it's like soil to to fruit and to full food. Annabelle has also been learning and teaching all of us the food ways. And so from cultivation of seed to cultivation of recipes and immersive experiences. So many of us have touched on today, and then we'll go back to prayer. I just This one feels important that if we didn't grow up in families where it was customary to, some of us did, and Annabelle did. So um, if you had parents who were born on the land in the Middle East or in North Africa, perhaps you grew up immersed with Arabic language at home and with food, food ways and culture at home. A lot of us, through inculcation of Zionism and and war and disruption, like very actively did not. So as Sivan described, how do we inhabit our heritage and our culture when it's been purposely quieted, silenced, uh, taken away from us? Um, Even the revulsion that Zionism has trained us to have towards our culture and and the aversion, how do we move through that and heal that? So folks like Annabelle and the community are actually teaching us how to produce the food so we can taste it in our mouths. And folks like Laura Elkislasi and Danny, you sang so beautifully, are teaching us the sounds of the music so we can pull it through our bodies. And that feels to me like specifically like to this question, what is the contribution of the artist? And the artist is us who have dedicated our professional lives to it. But the artist is every single one of you watching this, um, every human being in a body that can sense and feel. So we all have in a world that seeks to co-opt our agency and our attention and divide us and pit us against each other, we all have the freedom to choose to um, imagine into and then physicalize the taste, touches, sounds, and smells of the worlds we come from. So that when we say we will never forget and we will never forget this gen- genocide, we have olfactory and sensory tools to give us embodied memories. And it's really important. It's really pleasurable. It's really, really wonderful. Like to quote Tony K. Bambara and like the revolution must be irresistible. It's a really important part of our generation and our culture of praxis that we've learned from elder activists of like, this has to be divine, beautiful, felt, pleasurable, so we can persist in it and delight in it. So Coral, thank you for naming Annabelle and for naming your grandmother, Miriam. And one, oh, one more also dramaturgical note, you referenced the war for independence, and I want viewers at home to know, like, we we hold the Nakba, and we hold the language of the war of independence. We've been, we, uh, Jewish folks, were raised with, inside of Zionism, inside of um, other languages that even now we're still finding our ways to tell these histories and stories. So I think Lena had to pop out, it looks like, for a sec. Danny, you want to pray with us? Do you have an object you want to pray with for a little bit? Sure. Um... <laughs> I, uh, I I have an object, but I also have, uh, I guess we are talking about an internal object um, along the lines of what you were saying, uh, a song that I think, you know, draws these connections. Um, but my object object is, is this, this is um, 
in Ladino or Judaism, this is called a tespil, but it comes from Arabic, Arabic uh, tasbih, um, because the, it, this comes out of a tradition of of, um, of Muslim prayer, but uh, it also evolved into the original Eastern Mediterranean fidget toy. Um, and I bought this in Greece, actually. And um, this is like just a way that I ground myself. Um, and um, I feel so much uncertainty, you know, in, in, in these days. Um, and, uh, it, it helps me to just expand the way I'm thinking of myself to expand back to, to my ancestors and, you know, what they experienced, um, and how even just imagining that can sort of help me to imagine, uh, into the future. Um, and I'd love to share just a piece of this, um, song. It's, um, it's, a song in Ladino in the, the Judeo-Spanish language of the Sephardic Jews that were expelled from Spain and then um, largely settled in what was then the Ottoman Empire all, all around the Mediterranean in Levant and in uh, North Africa um, because, because Jews were welcome there. Um, and even that is just an important part of history that we're sort of encouraged to forget. Um, but this is a song about uh, about displacement, about exile, about the the pain of being forced to leave your home and not knowing um, what's next, uh, and um, and sort of connecting that to a, a, a love of land and a love of other people. Um, and so the song's called Arvolis, which means trees, and the the chorus is um, I I. Uh, I turn around and say, what will become of me in foreign lands? I will die. Arvoles lloran por luvias y montañas por aires. Ansi lloran los mis Ojos por ti, querida amante, torno y digo, ¿qué va a ser de mí? En tierras ajenas, Yo me vomuri. For time, I'll just stop at the one verse, but um, may we all uh, keep connecting to each other, keep connecting to our history, keep connecting to our common humanity in order to forge a, a future that, that truly honors our, our common humanity. Thank you all. Amen. I mean, Lena, welcome back. Perfect timing. Sivan, would you like to offer a prayer? Sure. Um, thank you, Danny, for that. That really grounded me. Um, I, I, I will offer this prayer. This is a bit different, but I'll offer this prayer um, uh, in honor of a scholar whose name I'd like to invoke here, whose name is Ella Shohat. And Ella is an Iraqi Jewish um, academic scholar, writer, theorist, um, whose work shaped the foundation of so much of what I understand about the connection between um, uh, uh, honoring and preserving Arab Jewish identity and the liberation of Palestine. Ella is someone who's um, writing paved the way for the work that I do now. Um, and so thank you, Ella, and to the work she continues to do um, to dream into a liberated future for Arab and Jaiswana Jews alongside Palestinians um, together. Uh, I guess this prayer is in, in I offer that to her. Um, and uh, I, I don't have the physical object with me, um, which is perhaps symbolic in some ways. Um, but it is a small amulet um, with three silver um, balls uh, and some, we call them hamsas, uh, small protections against the evil eye. 
And um, I didn't know that this object existed. A couple uh, years ago, I was having a very tough time in my personal life and it surfaced in my childhood home. And I was like, dad, what is this? And he was like, oh, that's your amulet, of course. And I was like, what amulet? What are you talking about? What? He was like, oh, you know, the one that hung on your crib that came from Iraq. And I was like, no, I didn't know about this object. Um, thank you so much for telling me. Uh, and I do have it and I, I treasure it. I keep it in a very safe place in my childhood home and I, I clutch it when I need it. Um, and, uh, you know, we we often joke like what made it into the exile box and I guess this one did. This object, this amulet, this protection against the evil eye made it um, for for children, for babies, um, made it into the exile box. And I held it on a a, a Zoom with a group of Jaiswana people a couple of years ago. And someone else said, well, I have the exact same one. It came from Baghdad. And that was very special. And um, and I I I hold it in my heart right now to protect the children of Gaza, the children of Gaza, um, wherever they are, um, whether they are still there, whether they have left. Um uh, and I, 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 I dream that it can provide protection to, to all the children of Palestine right now. Um, so I hold that in my heart right now as an offering and as a prayer, um, as it protected me and as it perhaps protected ancestors in my uh, lineage. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe so y'all thank you so much for this time. I will close us with a deep breath a description, and an introduction to the next session. Our Jewish tradition teaches, justice, justice, you shall pursue it, and to save one life, it's to save a world. Creation stories from across the Levant teach that the world was spoken into being. We're convening, and we've convened, to show up as vocal manifestations, Coral's beautiful words, of the intersection of Jewish, Arab, and Swana identities to demonstrate our active presence as partners and allies towards a free Palestine, now, today, and forever forward. And I just want to thank everyone in this room, Sivan, Coral, Danny, Lena, and all the ones holding down the space. And I'll introduce the next session. From Birch and Cedar to Olive Trees, Native Artists in Solidarity, which will be a Native American-led conversation in solidarity with the Palestinian people about lineages of displacement and tending and caring for ancestral homelands. Our moderator is Delana Studi, who's a director, actor, and the artistic director of Native Voices at the Outry. Welcome, Delana, and farewell, everyone, for now. <laughs>